All right, we are live. Greetings, greetings from the fifth dimension. Welcome to the podcast, Happy Dance's Guide to the Revolution. Jamie Fenton in the house. It's so good to see you. It's so great to see you, Jordan. It was good to catch up there a little bit before we started recording. You know, it's like our friendship is 10 plus years old. I was looking at like the date from like how we know each other. That's summer of 2009. Mm-hmm. I was thinking young, we were just young pups then. We <laughs> were little babies. <laughs> I know. I was painting houses with Chris. Oh, yeah. I was bringing guys pizza and Gatorade and yeah, uh, those were the days. It was fun, wasn't it? Like, and like, introduced to you through our mutual friend, Katie Sillinger. Um, Shout out to her. She's got mm-hmm. a baby on the way. Ooh, impending motherhood coming so soon. Anytime now, baby Adrian. Very soon. It could be like right now for all we know. Like it could be. Who knows? Maybe our maybe our talk of old times will, you know, spur it. That might happen. It's possible. It's possible. Uh so I met you through her and you're just like a smart, chill, like, you know, grown up ass woman, you know? Like <laughs> and you didn't take any shit. in such a way. <laughs> you didn't take any shit from anybody. And I love that about you, you know? Do no harm, but take no shit. I That's very right. much mantra mm-hmm. so, so meeting you back then um yeah. you were in that like really that weird phase between being teenagers and between like actually being adults and you were like one of the most unique people I met at, at those times because you have just always been just so unapologetically yourself and just so in tune with with what you wanted for yourself at that mm-hmm. time and in Sure. You know, I heard um, you reference in one of your past podcasts um, why you use the number three in the word revolution instead of an E. And I had this little giggle because that was your thing, you know, back when I first met you over 10 years ago. Exactly. Like that, you're, you're talking about the exact same things now that you were then. And that's such an admirable thing. And that's one thing that just like blew my mind about you back then. I was like, jeez. Like, he just knows, like, the things that are important to him and the things that he wants to do. Here you are doing them. And I'm just, like, I'm so proud to know you for that reason. That means a lot, you know. And I didn't really think about that. But I I was kind of talking about a lot of these same things. But I've come a long way, too, just, like, as an individual, just kind of doing better to take care of myself. And then, like, refining these ideas to kind of take them down the road of, like, what's possible here, you know. Like, obviously, right. we can criticize plenty of things. Lots of things need improvement. And Amen. and that language is embedded in the Declaration of Interdependence that I wrote, you know? So, yeah, revolt. we've been revolting, doing the revolution with love for 10 plus years. You're right. Yes. <laughs> You're right. The podcast is new, but we've been having these conversations for a long time. Waiting up now, finally. Mm-hmm. And it's fun. It's It's been a challenge. Uh but it's exciting. Like I'm at a point now where I can start paying for some advertising and things if I want. I'm just kind of waiting to see if that's the direction that I want to take it, you know, to get more people listening and involved. And I would, I've said this a couple of times now, really what my dream is putting a team together. If I can get a team of people to do these things and work on this, it would be very exciting. And I think we could do a really good job. Oh, I think I'm just, I'm so excited to see someone mm-hmm. like you taking, you know, this initiative and like spearheading something like this, because you, you just, you know, you have that, oomph, you have that, that mm-hmm. gumption to be able to really hold this together and move it forward. Um, and you just started answering my next question for you, you know, what phase of this are you in? And, you know, where do you project it to be going soon? You know, what do you think you, you need in order to move it on to the next phase and move it up mm-hmm. to the next level and get it where you want it to be going? It's a good question. Uh, couple things that I probably should start doing is I probably should start using the money that people have donated strategically and start kind of doing that because right now I haven't. Mm-hmm. And then I think the next thing that I'm keeping in mind is I want to bring in diverse people from diverse backgrounds and diverse takes on our current situation because, I mean, I'm, I feel myself being pushed towards the Bernie camp. But like, I don't want to come off as like, I'm in the Bernie camp, like exclusively. That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to like learn and like understand why people, why the people that still like Trump, like, like Trump, why, and there's- you know, like, I really want to know. So I want to bring those people in. I want to bring people from, you know, all different backgrounds, right? men, women, old, young, rich, poor, you know, everything. 
I think that's what that's the biggest thing that we're missing right now in any conversation about the current climate that we're in in our society versus where we want to be mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, those those um, young, enthusiastic people who realize that um, having those differences is not that doesn't mean that there has to be a wall there and that you can't communicate with those people. We need those opposing ideals. We need those different perspectives. We don't have evolution. We don't have growth. We don't have change if we don't have challenges in the way that we think Mm -hmm. to help us evolve and round out what we're doing. So it's amazing to me that you want to have those conversations and you want to bring all of those opposing ideals together, because that's the one thing that we're really missing right now, that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, group of people who really want to actually find that commonality and that starting point with those opposing ideals to all come to that, you know, the the outcome that we all really do want. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the revolution and the love thing Mm -hmm. is because when I see these conversations taking place on like a Facebook thread or whatever, there's no love there. It's not, you're not, it's it's like a game and no one's keeping score, but everyone's still trying to win, you know? Mm -hmm. And it feels so like, you know, and I, it taxes me emotionally. Like when I get involved in any of that stuff, like I'm emotionally taxed for like the next 12 hours, especially if I get like, if it's, especially if it's somebody I care about or something, you know, it's tough. Definitely. It's, it's so difficult to, to remove yourself and not seem detached to those mm-hmm. people at the same mm-hmm. time. Um, cause we're in that really touchy spot where everybody wants to be heard, mm-hmm. but, but nobody wants to listen. Mm-hmm. So it seems even if you, even if you play that mediator role where you say, you know, everybody's making some valid points here, you know, let's just try and focus on that. Mm-hmm. Um, People are upset about that too, because we're just in that mindset where we're right. You know, we know what's going on. We're right. And the other person is wrong. Mm. Um, so hard to try and have those productive conversations and try and keep it to a place where, you know, everyone can share exactly what they feel and what they think, but also still kind of leave a little room to be able to say, you know what? I, can't, I don't agree with you completely, but you mm. make a valid when you say this. Um, you know, I've had times when I've deactivated my Facebook for a few weeks at a time because I just, I had to remove myself yeah. from that space yeah. because it was very taxing. Mm. And the reason that I did this podcast is to have those conversations here. Mm-hmm. Where it's easier to love. When you're talking to one person, it's easier to listen and it's very easier much. to love them and love yourself. And the conversation is just better for it. And you actually can arrive at a place together. I agree. So, so I got to bring those people in. As challenging it's going to be, I need to find good people that kind of, I don't, and I don't want to put somebody in a box either. Like they represent this and like, that's why I want, but at the same time, it is that a little bit because I'm trying to, okay, what kind of categories of people do I, can I represent here? You know? So that's going to change. I'm trying to create something productive and we need many cogs to that wheel in order to make Mm -hmm. it actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, do you have any ideas about our democracy in general and how we might reshape things or feelings on any of the ideas that I put forth in the various podcasts or like, where are you at with grand vision of how we might make some adjustments? Oh, goodness. Um, I think that's such a, it's such a nuanced subject when you talk about it, but um... Something I think it, it feels wrong to you, you know, like something that just feels, yeah. It really, it truly does. And it's, it's disheartening when you sit down and you really pick it apart and you try and, you know, think in your mind, how, how does this get fixed? You know, how do we pull this all together? Um, and I, I don't think that it's something that we can do without a revolution, without an actual uprising, without people deciding that it's time to be completely done with the status quo that we set. Um, and that's a, that's a, t- a somewhat tall order right now to get everyone on the same page and everyone on that same team to be able to take that back. But the entire structure that we have, you know, our Democrat versus Republican and liberal versus conservative and, and our teams, you know, trying to decide what we feel is best for our society and our people as a whole, um, all of that needs to be dismantled. It really does. Um, and that starts with conversation, like what we're doing here. Um, it starts with reform on, you know, voting rights. It starts with paying attention, you know, paying attention to mental health. It starts with um, parenting, you know, how we're raising our children. 
Um, it starts with changing conversation around um, what it means to be PC or too sensitive or, you know, compassion being a weakness versus, you know, brute strength being the most important thing. There's so many things that need to be changed. And so much of that is viewpoint and perspective that needs to be changed. So I think the most important thing is conversation like this that reaches the masses, conversations like this that spread and allow us to actually come together as a community and say, this is our end goal. It's the same, better quality of life for everyone, mm -hmm. better standing for everyone, equal rights for everyone. Um, you know, I tend to identify as a liberal, but not in a liberal, extreme liberal, but in a liberal sense where I, you know, I, I agree with everyone's rights. If you want to own a gun, you should own a gun. As long as you're responsible and you're not an immediate threat to the community, if you want to own a gun, you should do that. If you're gay and you want to get married, please get married. I think that everyone's rights are equally as important. And there's a way to find that middle ground to be able to ensure that all of them are protected. And so much of that starts with the way that we look at the people around us. So that love, that compassion, that willingness to understand, that willingness to be able to sit down and have a conversation and mm -hmm. see where we're in the middle. So very nuanced. Yep. Yep. And it's easier said than done, right? Because I 100% agree, you know, but when you take these things at such a broad societal scale, they're complicated. I mean, even to bring it at the individual level of like, taking individual responsibility and like having your own goal setting, and having, you know, your own uh, being compassionate to yourself and others in your own life, you know, that even that it can be difficult and is difficult. You know, that's the hardest work, I think any of us can do and any of us should do. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I actively work on, especially, you know, in the present climate that we're in. Um, I do have a mediator type personality. You know, when I meet people, I want to like them, always want to like someone. I'm going to find the good things in that person and I'm going to do everything I can to interact with those good things. Mm -hmm. That's who I am by nature. I could probably adopt but, a little bit of that. Yes. But I also have this really combative side to myself where I get a little fiery and I, I, you know, I get a little defensive and, and sometimes, you know, I lose it a little bit. And over the last few years, I've really been working on that, on the ability to not lash out at something that I think is ridiculous. My ability to be able to take a breath and say, okay, you know, this person's position is coming from a position of caring or is coming from a position of, you know, concern or is coming from the same general direction that mine is, but you know, they're just, they're seeing it come together a little differently. And that's really hard work to do, to be able to look in and say, hmm, there are some things that I could change about myself to make this entire human experience and my communication with other people better. Um, hardest work I've ever done, for sure. I'm still working at it every single day, but I'm trying my damnedest to be that person who can sit across from anybody who disagrees with me and say, you know, I've got ears to listen. Right. Yeah. And... A lot of people are probably just frustrated too. They, and maybe they're just frustrated about different things than you're frustrated about. So two frustrated people kind of bouncing off each other. You gotta you almost have to be willing to receive their frustrated energy and like right. absorb it and listen, you know, and like bring them back down before they're ever gonna listen. You know? I've started looking, trying to look at uh people that I <laughs> have opposing ideals with as siblings. Mm -hmm. And say, okay, if this were my sibling across mm -hmm. from me, siblings have some of the craziest arguments in the world. If this were my sibling sitting across from me right now, how would I respond to my sibling? Right. Right. That same sibling love that I would give them in that moment where maybe I'm a little combative at first, but eventually I soften toward them and realize that, hey, let's, you know, let's be civil with each other. I always try to look at everyone I speak to as one of my siblings now. <laughs> That's powerful. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea because what it implies is like, I love this person and they're not like easily expendable. Like we don't want to just get rid of them. We don't just want to nope. just like remove them from our life. We don't want to just like ignore them and shut them out. And like, you can't, can't do any of that. You have to be able to like move forward together. You have to be able to receive their grievances, receive their upset, and mm -hmm. you've got to be the, you know, shovel out some love and hope that that leads to them, you know, giving that to you in return. Mm. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's mm. the most important work that we do if we want 
a more civilized and a happier and a kinder and a more loving society, which is what we need. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to listening, like you said, too. A lot of mm -hmm. times someone just wants to be heard. You know, they're frustrated. They want you to know why they're frustrated. Once they, once you know, once they know that you know, uh -huh. then they can be like, okay, well, now, now what do I do? Uh, you know, they can, it's the, it's the first step, maybe, you know. Get it out. <laughs> okay, so speaking of, speaking of being a mama, Ooh. let's talk about that a little bit. So. Little Willa Rowena. Mm-hmm. Willa Rowena. And your partner, Jason. That's yes. You got yourself a little fan there, huh? Yes, it's amazing. Jason is... I like to think I was an incredibly kind person before I met Jason, but since meeting Jason, I think I'm probably about five times kinder. He is the most inherently kind, yeah. giving, selfless person I've ever known in my life. And we created the most amazing little person. She just turned two. She is just naturally calm and sweet and even tempered and smiley and cuddly. And she's just she's a little ray of sunshine. <laughs> That's amazing. You're so, you guys are so lucky, you know? Really are really and truly every day. I have enjoyed every single hour of parenthood. And I think that's really saying something. And let me get this part straight. Like you grew the human inside of you, right? That's how that works, mm -hmm. right? That is how it works. And it's, um, yeah. it's all really weird and, um, it's very alien and it's amazing. And it fills you with so many opposing emotions. Um, I know I, I knew since I was a kid that I, that I wanted to be a mom. That was just something that I knew within myself. Mm -hmm. I knew I'm going to be a mom and I'm going to have a little girl and. Oh, you knew it was going to be a girl too, huh? I knew it was going to be a girl. I knew it. Um, so I always knew that. And uh, Jason and I met and we fell in love really quickly. And we were about six months into our relationship when we decided that we wanted to start a family. So, yeah, we, we decided we were just going to jump right in. And I said, um, you know, it's probably going to take us at least, you know, six months um, for this to really happen. So, you know, we've got some time. And then three and a half months later, positive pregnancy test. And it was instantly that um Oh, yeah, this is this is happening. We're doing she this. It got real. It, it got real really quickly. Um, and then your body starts doing all of these crazy things. Like I almost passed out in the shower a bunch of times during my pregnancy because your body temperature just naturally elevates and you can't take hot showers anymore. That almost happened a few times. Suddenly I hated grape juice, which was incredibly upsetting. That Couldn't is drink grape. It is. It's delicious. It's I could not do it. Top of all the juices, I would say. It's a, it, it helps with stomach viruses. It's medicinal. And my body said, no, none. No grape juice. I could drink white grape juice, though. So baby granted me that. Um, nice. But in general, I was really lucky. I enjoyed my entire pregnancy. I was that annoyingly super smiley, like lit up, dewy skinned pregnant woman, you know, walking around, rubbing her belly and just, you know, loving every minute of it it's beautiful ankles like, you know ankles like sourdough bread and just you know loving every single minute of it um so i think the craziest part of impending parenthood is trying to prepare <laughs> especially when it's your first time you know you're mm. you're like right well it's there um so i i did that part and you know my body is just gonna like grow it you know there's gonna be eyeballs and feet yeah. and like functioning liver and like all of those things. So like all that's taken care of, but there's stuff, you know, like, how do I do this? How do I go about this process? How am I going to birth? Um, what's best for me when it comes to birth? And the conversation around birth in this country is really scary. Um, you know, the United States of America has the highest rate of infant and maternal death in the entire developed nation. Um, Yes, we as a country kill more mothers and babies in childbirth than any other developed country on the nation. Um, and that's that's, mind blowing right now. that's true. That's like, that's pretty staggering. It is very much so. And it's a combination of many things. Um, much of it is, you know, the fact that, you know, healthcare is, is a business here. Um, so we're not getting you know, that incredibly personalized care, you know, even pregnant women who are bringing new life into this world, you know, we're, we're numbers. Mm -hmm. um, 
contributing factor is um, the cesarean rate. Um, although that has declined, uh, cesareans are still pushed, you know, at a rapid pace, you know, when uh, labor is taking too long or when, you know, a mother's blood pressure increases slightly and there's a lot of unnecessary C-sections. Um, that's, that's a very dangerous way to bring a baby into this world. You know, that's a major surgery to bring a child into this world. Um, well, reading all these statistics and then reading the further statistic that Black women are 237% more likely to die during childbirth what? than white women. Yes, that's another staggering statistic. Um, and that has to do, one, with um, health concerns that tend to plague Black women over white women, but it also has to do with um, still existing systemic racism within the healthcare system where Black women, especially in urban communities, tend to receive subpar care and tend to be listened to less than their doctors than their white, you know, than white women are. Mm -hmm. um, so all these statistics, you know, had me thinking, how, how do I do this for myself in a way that's safest and a way that I will feel most in control and in a way that I can be most calm and feel most confident. Um, and I grew up with the same, you know, image of childbirth that, you know, every girl grows up with when she watches things like ER and stuff, you know, women are wheeled into the hospital and they're screaming in agony and there's 27 people around them and they're being rushed into a room and it's noisy and there's lights all over the place and it's chaos and, you know, just wildness. So my entire life thinking about being a mom, I always thought when I go into labor, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm just going to freak out. I'm, I'm going to be screaming. I'm going to be, I'm just going to be a crazy person when I go into labor. Mm -hmm. And then we conceived Willa and I said, um, how do I not do that? Because I don't want to do that. I would like to give birth, not screaming and not anxiety ridden, <laughs> not losing my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started looking around and, you know, reading about natural birth and I knew I didn't want it to be medicated. I knew I wanted to be, you know, sharp. I wanted, you know, my baby to not be, you know, having any foreign substances in their body either. Uh, so I knew that much and I stumbled upon water birthing, which is a little more natural of an environment for a baby to be born into, you know, they're encased in fluid the entire time they're growing. So it makes you know pretty much common sense that to birth them into water from them being inside water would be a bit smoother of a transition for them. So I was looking into that and still planning on a hospital birth. And I realized that none of the hospitals in the area would allow me to actually deliver in a tub. You know, I would be allowed to labor in there, but when it came time to actually push and, you know, bring that baby earthside, I would then have to get out of that tub and into a hospital bed. And I didn't love the idea of that. So at the time I was working for a physical therapy studio and I knew one of the PTs there had, um, had had some natural births. And I asked her if she knew anything about water birthing. And she said, no, but I delivered my second two children at home. And instantly I thought, what? And she said, yes. And if I'd known then, you know, what I know now, I would have had all four of my children at home to which I said, shut the front door. That sounds bananas. Um, so she lent me this book, Ina Mae Gaskin's Guide to Childbirth. And Ina Mae Gaskin is considered the mother of modern midwifery in this country. Um, so I read this amazing book. It's the only book that I read during my pregnancy, the one and only. And this book was just filled with stories of natural births, both in a home setting and in a hospital setting. And I was just amazed by all these stories, all these different births, births that were complicated, births that were, you know, quote unquote easy. And I was so inspired by these stories and by the strength in these women. But by the time I was done reading it, I said, this is what I'm going to do. I want to have my baby at home, unmedicated, with a midwife, because yep. my body needs to do this. And that's what I'd like to do. So I said, Jason, I'd like to have my baby at home. And he said, no, no. He said, you, you need a, you need a doctor <laughs> to which I said, okay, hear me out. And I went down my list of reasons. You know, I'm, I'm a very secluded person. I like my space. That's really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, too much stimuli tends to overwhelm me. I have not spent much time in a hospital. Um, and one thing I discovered in my first 20 weeks of pregnancy, when I was with the primary OB was that most women are, you know, working with a hospital where they work with a physician's group. So you have like a team of six different doctors that you'll see throughout your pregnancy. 
And there's no guarantee as to which of them will be there to deliver your baby at the end. And that freaked me out. I was like, so somebody who maybe met me two or three times is just going to come walking into the room and say, okay, let's do this. I don't know anything about your demeanor. I don't know anything about what type of bedside manner you need. I don't know anything about what type of tone of voice you need me to use in order to help you through this. I don't know anything, but trust me with your body and your baby. (laughs) And I thought to myself, you know, all these doctors, I really, I want somebody who knows my body, knows the plan that I have for myself, um, and knows what I'm going to need in order to do this calmly. So from 20 weeks all the way to the end of 40 weeks, I turned my care over to a midwife and midwife assistant, um, someone who was in her apprenticeship to become a midwife. Mm-hmm. And that was just such an amazing experience. Um, you know, they came to my home for every single appointment. So I never had to travel for prenatal appointments. Um, you know, they came armed with all this amazing equipment like this, um, fetal Doppler that could allow them to hear the baby's heartbeat, but it looked like this long stethoscope with a funnel at the end of it. And they just put the funnel against my stomach and listen and move it around and they'd be able to find the baby's heartbeat with this little cone on the end of a stethoscope. Um, And, you know, they were able to just palpate my stomach and tell me, you know, the baby's head is here. You know, the baby's feet are down here. And I was just so amazed at this incredible, like, natural medicine that they were using Mm. and I found myself just getting really excited about delivery which was a drastic change from what I originally thought was going to happen Mm. so Willa was born the day before her due date she was very prompt that little one pretty much right on time a little early this is the way it should be came just a little bit early but she did she was stubborn and she made it wait and um One thing that I do love about my story is that it's a really positive story and you don't really hear many of those as an expected mom, um, which I think is one of the the biggest drawbacks when it comes to the conversation around birth and pregnancy in this country is that there's so little positive support for women who are getting ready to birth. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we share that we're expecting and instantly we get flooded with, you know, the horror stories and the, the day I gave birth was the worst day of my life. And you know, oh, hope you're ready to give up your sleep now. And there's just all of these, you know, little things being lobbed at us about how terrible it's going to be and how awful it's going to be and how much of ourselves we're going to be losing and giving up in this process. And I want that conversation to change so badly. And for more women to realize that it doesn't have to be that way, that there's a such thing as a positive experience when it comes to pregnancy. There's a such thing as an empowering birth and one that you actually kind of enjoyed um i want women to realize that there's a such thing as naturally birthing a baby and being excited to do it again um i that's something that i want to change so desperately so much so that after my experience i decided that it's my goal to become a doula within the next five years so i want to be able to lead women through that process um so the day that willa arrived it was very very cold very cold and I had a birthing tub. It was very cold, you said? It was, oh, it was freezing outside. Oh, yeah. I think the temperature was maybe like three degrees that morning. And Jason needed to fill my birthing tub with a hose that ran mostly from the outside. So oh, cold. It was, yes, it was very cold. So he was using the hose and he was boiling multiple pots of water and running up and down the stairs to, you know, fill this massive tub for me. Good man. He's on it. He, he was amazing that entire day, but... Um, we had a birth photographer with us for the day as well. Um, I saw those pictures. They're outstandingly beautiful. It They're was amazing. an amazing day. I pretty much cried, I think, when I looked at them, if I remember. Oh, you cried, and that's so wonderful. I cry every time I look at them. I mean, sob uncontrollably. <laughs> 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 but that day, that day was, yeah. it was one of the most beautiful days of my life. It was a long one. Um, I went into active labor the night before, so the body goes through so many phases um, when you start to go into labor. I might be wrong about this, so don't directly quote me on it, but I think, I believe there are nine phases of labor. Um, So I saw my midwives the day before she was born for just a standard appointment. And when they left, I was 60% effaced and three centimeters dilated. So my body was already in like early, early labor. Um, so they expected she was going to be coming, but I could have stayed at that place for like another week and a half, um, with absolutely no movement. 
but by 10 o'clock that night, I, I started my contractions, which were about four minutes apart. And I called my midwife and I was like, hey, and I think something's happening. And <laughs> she said, I'm going to recommend that you get some sleep. And she said, I'm going to get some sleep too. And, you know, just call me first thing in the morning. And I thought to myself, how am I supposed to get sleep yeah. when I have this crazy back pain going through my low back right now when these contractions go through me? And contractions are such a crazy experience. Um, it's like, you know that feeling when you're vomiting, when you're at the deepest part of that heave and everything inside your body is just like tightening? It's like that. Yes. Um, that's, like, that's one of the worst feelings. Yeah, but like persistent for like 45 seconds at a time. Uh, so just, ooh, just, you know, so mm -hmm. this is happening to my body. And uh, it's intense. <laughs> this is a crazy story. <laughs> okay. I'm with you. It is very crazy. So four minutes apart, you know, these things are rolling through my body, lasting for about a minute. And poor Jason is like, you know, I feel bad, you know, sleeping. I shouldn't sleep. And, you know, I'm saying I need you to sleep because tomorrow gonna shit's going gonna, gonna to get real. <laughs> and I'm going to need you sharp because <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do this by myself. So uh, for the first time in our entire relationship, his snores were comforting to me. I did not want to put a pillow over his face. Um, it actually helped me sleep a little bit. And around six o'clock the next morning, I called my midwife because she lived an hour away. And I said, okay, I'm about two and a half minutes apart with my contractions now. And, uh, you know, she just calmly said, all right, I'm on my way. So we, I was puttering around the house. We listened to 1960s music for the entire 13 hours that day. Like Bless what? every person who was in that room. <laughs> 1960s, like what? Like, what were you jamming? 1960s, that was it for me. Um, that's all I wanted was some oldies music that was going to make me dance. Let me listen to some Chuck Berry. Let me listen, just just leave that on. And yeah. that's exactly what happened. She was born to a Rolling Stone song, which... Ooh. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, you, get up. My, my cloud was what I heard when that little one popped into this world. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So they arrived at about 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was two of them, right? The assistant and the and the midwife, and my and my birth photographer. All of them arrived at pretty much the same time, and we were about halfway through setting up the birth tub at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they they checked me to see how far along I was. I was now one hundred percent effaced, and seven and a half centimeters out of ten centimeters dilated. So I was almost completely ready to go. Um, at this point, I was still dancing through my house, to, <laughs> to which my midwife said, I don't know <laughs> how you're doing this. <laughs> don't talk to other pregnant women about what labor and delivery is like, because this probably shouldn't be happening right now, um, which was amazing because I went into birth thinking that I had a relatively low pain tolerance. You know, I was preparing myself for having not so easy of a time. And then I ended up really surprising myself and finding out that my pain threshold is actually miraculously high in such a scenario. So it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So it was a long day and it was a lot of waiting, which really surprised me because right. I was so far along when they arrived and I just kind of thought that, all right, you know, we're in it. So my body is just going to cycle on through and, you know, she'll just, you know, she'll be here by lunchtime, you know, it's seven 30 in the morning. And by lunchtime, she was not there. She was not there. Um, my water had not broken yet. Um, my contractions were somewhat picking up. Um, I was dilating just a little bit more, but not completely. I got to nine centimeters dilated and then I stayed there for hours. Um, and if I uh, broke my water, she said, you know, this could speed things up. We could break your water. And I said, yes, let's, let's do that. You know, we're some hours into it. Let's speed up this process. So she broke my water. I got back into the tub. And I was in there for probably about another three hours in there between that and walking through the house, dancing through the house, whatever. Um, and we, they, would mon they would monitor me about every half an hour or so just to check my blood pressure, my heart rate, and check the baby's mm -hmm. heart rate. She was doing well. And then we were about 11 hours in. And, wow. mm -hmm, and my midwife said, okay, Jamie here's what's going on. <laughs> you have not dilated your final centimeter. You have a lip covering the opening of your cervix. 
and this is stopping Willa from dropping completely into position in your birth canal. So we have a couple options. We can continue to wait and hope that your body naturally dilates that final centimeter and that lip pulls back so she can drop, or you can try to push past that lip. And uh, I was ready. So I said, I'm, I'm, I, let, me, let me try and push past it and get her you know, down where she belongs. So, so many ingenious techniques. They had me sit on a stool so gravity would work with me. And then they brought out this bungee cord type thing. So you're still in the tub? So you're on the stool in the tub? I got out of the tub. Okay. We moved into the bedroom. They sat me down on this birthing stool mm -hmm. and bring out the bungee cord thing with a handle on either end. So my midwife would hold one end and she gave me the other end and had me pull back. And that allowed me to push more deeply so that I could try and push her down into the birth canal where she belonged. Mm -hmm. So I, I pushed in that position to try and push her down for a little over 45 minutes. And I was pretty tired by that point. <laughs> I yeah. was pretty tired. Yeah. I, at, that I, point, I, at that point I was thinking, you know what? I could just go for like a quick nap right now. <laughs> just give me like a yeah. you know, 30, 35 minutes. From like so much physical exertion over such a prolonged period of time. Exactly. So, you know, they, they ended up saying, all right, let's stand you up and we'll just have you shake your hips out and, you know, we'll move you into a different position and see what we can do. So I got up, you know, I stood, I shook my hips out and she just dropped right into place. I felt her like almost click right into my pelvis. And I was like, hmm. And there's something called a fetal ejection reflex. <clears throat> and it's when your body takes over your contractions and you really don't have control over them anymore. Your body just takes over and says, okay, we're going to pull all these muscles up and we're just going to push. So I'm standing with Jason on one side of me and one midwife on the other. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. we have to get into my next position because I don't have any control over these anymore. So they moved me to the bed um, on hands and knees over the birthing stool to give me a little more space in my pelvis. Um, and I started pushing that way and uh, she crowned and then she got stuck. Yep, she got stuck. Her head got stuck with about this much of it out. That's just stuff. My legs are falling asleep. <laughs> this feeling of her exiting my body is um, very interesting. How do I explain that? Indian rug burns? You know, when somebody would take your, your arm and twist yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It feels like that as your baby is exiting and stretching everything out, except in the most sensitive area that you never wanted to experience that sensation. Oh, so you've got all this adrenaline coursing through you. So that pain is really nothing in the grand scope of things. <laughs> it's nothing. You're just, your body is just taking over. And uh, she was stuck for a few minutes. And finally my midwife said, okay, um, we've got to get her out. You know, she's been like this for a couple minutes. So I'm just going to have you pick your leg up and swing it into a runner stance so we can open up your pelvis a little further. And I said, that sounds great, but my legs are asleep. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to be doing that. So my tiny little, you know, midwife assistant picks up my leg and swings it up into position. And uh, I gave another push and her head cleared. And I remember thinking oh. to my. I remember thinking to myself, like, just another, another few more pushes and she's going to be here. And it was one. One. And then this really weird sensation where it just felt like she just, like, just sailed out of me. And then there was this crazy moment of absolute silence. And then the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard in my entire life when she oh cried. My God. I have chills. It was when you hear that sound it's it's like you're hearing this sound that you wanted to hear your whole entire life but you didn't know it so this sound just fills the air and it's just this so many feelings flood through you in this moment like there's this new person that's here and you brought that new person here and it was so much work and you were so tired and now you couldn't possibly think of sleeping because they're here so, you know, I was on my hands and knees. She was behind me. So I'm so scared to move. She's still attached to me, but, you know, by her umbilical cord. So I'm just staying put, waiting to see her while they're, you know, cleaning her. And they finally slid her underneath me so I could take a look at her. 
Ah. Oh, we lost you for a second. You're back though. So she stood from underneath you. And I, she just, she looked. She looked like I'd always imagined she was, she was going to look. She came out looking just like Jason for the record. All that work I did. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Came well, out looking he's a handsome dude, like right? He's a handsome guy. So, you know, it's still a win. Exactly. No, she looks like you. I've seen pictures. I see, I see you in her face for sure. She marked a little bit. She really did. But now it's to a point where it depends on which one of us is holding her as to who she looks exactly like. Mm-hmm. Pass her and she looks just like both of us. Yeah. That was, I also had a, I also had a moment of, ah, because she'd gotten stuck. So her head was like in this enormous cone shape. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I looked out and I was like, oh, ah. Uh, and my midwife, my midwife was like, no, no, those bones are going to settle. Like her head's not going to stay like that. To which I was like, oh goodness, you know. <laughs> that's why, uh, that's why it's like that, right? It's intentionally. So it's in. It's in five different pieces that all are able to overlap and slide over themselves so that they can actually, they fold over each other so they can go through that birth now and out into the world. Um, the female body, I mean, you men are amazing too, but the female body is just such a ridiculous machine. I just, I've never been more proud of my body in my entire life. It yeah. looks completely different than it used to. Um, it should by all means feel like a completely alien thing, but there's something about your body going through that and, and having this undeniable reliability on your body. You know, birth is, it's a pretty traumatic experience for the body. You know, so much happens. And man, your body gets you through it like a champ and you have no choice afterward, but to look at your body and be like, you know what? Yes. <laughs> you yeah. are amazing. Um, there are still days when I look at myself and I'm like, I did that thing that one time, that like really intense thing. And like all these things happened and mm-hmm. there were, you know, fluids and, and, and tears and all sorts of strange things and and when you were done there was like a new person that was there this new person and those first couple of weeks afterward are terrifying there's this tiny like little person all folded on themselves and they're so small and you know you pick them up and it's just like a like all right i'm gonna move them to the next surface and just like gently place them down and you're you know, scared to pull their arm through a sleeve because they're just so small and so new and you have this entire personality that they already have that you have to try and get to know in those first few weeks so that you can learn what they like and what they don't like and, you know, what works for them and makes them feel safe. And it's just this never ending process of trial and error as you get to know this little person that you made, but is somehow already completely and totally their own person. Mm-hmm. I've learned that very much so in my motherhood in that um, I made her and she's a part of me, but she, she belongs completely to herself. And my role as her parent is definitely not to make her who she is. It's my job to guide the person that she already is and naturally begins to become with those little lessons that I give her. Um, I've heard it described as a, uh, a photograph. Mm-hmm. Whatever you and Jason did, you captured like a photograph. And there's a lot you can do to like mess up a photograph, you know? Oh, yeah. But the best thing you can do is just like, just not mess it up, you know? Just kind of like let it be itself in its expressed way, however, it, when it develops, you know? Exactly. So it's, I think you become a lot more aware um, when you become a parent of just how crucial the environment that you grow up directly in really is, um, and the person you become. I know, um, you know, my relationship with my own parents growing up was, you know, it was difficult, you know, and we've worked through that since I've become an adult and, you know, I've been able to look at the way that my parents parented and pick out the things that, you know, I want to move forward with, but I've also been able to pick out things that, um, I'd like to do differently. And it's scary to apply those things and try things differently than, how you may have been raised and, and, you know, have faith that the things that you're doing are actually going to shape them into the person that you so, you so want them to be able to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
So it's so much, a lot of self-work comes with parenting, a lot of um, inner reflection, a lot of realizing who it is that you really should be um, in order to provide the best example for that child. Mm -hmm. Um, I've become a lot softer since becoming a parent. Um, You know, we're not a softer. We're not a softer. We're not a household. I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty loud person. You know, as a pet owner, I've always, I've been a yeller, you know, that's kind of the home that I grew up in. You know, we were yellers and, um, it was very loud, you know, when it came to people being upset. And, uh, that was one thing that I realized I, I didn't, I didn't want to do, and I didn't want to be. Um, and fortunately that hasn't been the most difficult thing, partially because my child, she's, She's so easygoing that it's rare for me to have days when I'm really frustrated with her. But I've had a few times where I have yelled, you know, there's been a million things going on and a million things on on the to-do list. And, you know, she's off being, you know, her wild toddler self. And, and I've, you know, just, and, ah, and in those moments, it's awful. And one thing I've learned is that, you know, they're, they're babies and they're children, but they're also people. So I've had to teach myself um, to be critical of myself in those moments, especially, um, and to realize that no matter how small she is, she is a person. So the times that I've yelled, the times that I'm impatient with her, she's only two, but I get down on her level and I apologize. You know, I'm sorry that I yelled, you know, I'm sorry that I scared you. I was frustrated, but just because I was frustrated doesn't mean that I have to take that out on you. You have to realize that they're people and they don't understand why you're upset. So explain that to them mm-hmm. and hope raise an emotionally intelligent child right. who's able to recognize their own emotions and able to recognize when they've behaved in a way that's lesser than what they could and allows them to also be able to instantly own that and say, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm going to try and be better. Yeah, because we don't get to choose like whether or not we have emotions. We, we don't. They're just- you, just, you get to choose your awareness of them and Mm -hmm. how much you let them control your actions. Very much so. It's always, the parent community is kind of a difficult place to be. While you can definitely find a lot of support in there, there's also, there's a lot of judgment um, in different ways that people parent. And Everyone wants to think that they're right and that the way that they're doing it is exactly right. And Mm -hmm. you probably hold on to that idea pretty firmly um, because it's such, you know, it's part of your life, you know? So I, you're going to be sensitive about a subject. It's probably that one, right? Very much so. And people truly are. Um, And it's, there's a thousand different ways to raise a child correctly. You know, there's, every child is different. Every child's needs are going to be different. Every child's environment is different. Um, But as a whole, you can really kind of tie parenthood back into, you know, the discussion we we're having earlier about, you know, what it's going to take to turn things around, you know, for us as, as a people and as a society. And I think part of that responsibility lies really heavily on the shoulders of parents right now and the type of people that we're raising and the things that we're using to raise them. Um, you know, there needs to be conversation about um, the language that we use with our children and, um, how we choose to prop them up, how we choose to discipline them, um, the type of attention we choose to give them and all of those things are really important. So, you know, Jason and I kind of go with like a gentle parenting approach where, you know, there's no yelling and there's, you know, no spanking and there's none of that negative um, behavior from us that would cause her to fear us um, because we genuinely feel that if we just treat her as an actual person, and listen and speak and create space for her to grow and to make mistakes and to have our guidance there to help her. Um, that that's ultimately going to help her grow into a kind and compassionate person and a person who can listen to other people and a person who's emotionally intelligent enough to be able to really create some good in the rest of the world. And I think, um, it's difficult raising children now because it was so different for our parents. Um, Things were just so different in the sense that we didn't have technology and we didn't have the masses of resources that we have now to read all of this, you know, opposing information on what's right and what's wrong and what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And, you know, what has negative connotations and what has purely positive connotations and what they should be eating and what they should be wearing. And, 
mm-hmm. you know, all of these various things that people like to nitpick about when it comes to kids, you know, our parents didn't have thousands of people able to, you know, attack them for the choice that they were making for their child and say, no, you shouldn't be doing this. You should mm-hmm. be doing it this way. Um, so I think we have a responsibility, anyone who's parenting right now to actually, um, create some space for each other and to actually, um, take responsibility and realize that the way that you parent your children matters, the way that you speak to your children matters. And that the example that you provide and the way that you interact with adults around you is also going to shape your children and shape how they affect the world around them. Mm. Um, that's my base mission is to raise a child who is kind and compassionate and productive um, you know, I, I say this often, I, I want a child who's going to, you know, look into her neighbor's bowl, not to see, you know, whether or not they have more than her or whether or not they deserve what's in their bowl, but someone, you know, a child who's going to look into their neighbor's bowl just to make sure that they have enough. Um, I want a world like that so badly where everyone is banding together and making sure that everyone mm-hmm. is taking care of where it's not a competition of, of, well, it looks like, you know, you have a little more than me, but, uh, do you have enough? Does everyone have a piece of this. Um, so I'm trying my damnedest to be that parent and to raise somebody who's going to be able to carry these things forward and and implement them in a way that really matters when she's grown. It's a lot of responsibility to carry It that. is. The enormity of it will really sock you in the stomach some days. <laughs> you know, you'll have days when they're, you know, running past you in their fairy wings and, you know, it's mm-hmm. so whimsical and they're so, you know, innocent and everything in their world is right in that moment. And, and um, you can only keep them in that, in that little place for mm-hmm. so long, you know, before they're out in the world and you have to trust that the things that you've shown them are going to be enough for them to be able to find a place in the world that treats them kindly and is open to what they have to offer, which hopefully if you've done your parenting job, right, is an awful lot. Sounds like you're doing it right. Oh, I'm trying. <laughs> At least like one of the right ways. Cause like you said, there might be a thousand right ways. There are so many, you know, every kid is different, but it seems thus far like what we've got going for Willa is working because she's an exceptional little baby. She really is. Wow. So many, so many directions to take this. I want to go back to the ultimate decision to have a home birth. Let's mm-hmm. go back to that for a minute. Yes. Um, I think it says a lot about like our current culture that that was such a radical thing to do because historically and prehistorically it's not that radical at all right i mean like just to kind of give it an analogy you know how like on if you become friends with somebody on facebook or whatever and you have the messenger app it like suggests that you wave at them and you could wave at them through the facebook app you know yeah. like that's like going to the hospital to have a baby like all of this technology in order for you to have the baby there just like all of this technology so you can wave at your new friend you know, right. But like we waved at people for a long time, you know, Yes. Long Actually, do, you, do you know what this is? Like, do you know why we wave? No. So I'm not hundred percent sure on this, but it makes sense intuitively. It's basically a gesture of peace. Like I'm not carrying any weapons. Like you can, yes. here's, my, here's my right hand, the one I'm most likely to kill you with. And as you can see, it's empty. There's nothing in it. Yes. So hello. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I got on a tangent there. While we're on the tangent, though, do you know what this comes from? The middle finger? No, tell me. Uh, I think it is. Again, I could be wrong, but this is what I learned. It has to do with, like, bows and arrows. And, you know, if you were caught, they would cut off your bow finger because you would use it to pull the pull the string right. back, you know? So oh. if you were, like, leaving the battle or whatever and still had your bow finger and you were still coming for more, like, you weren't done. You I was like, yeah. As you're riding away on your horse, like I'm, I'm coming for you. Yes. You know what? I hope that's the truth because that's a badass story. That's I like cool, it. Right? That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so yeah, like all this technology that enables hospitals to even do what they do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and again, a thousand different ways you can do it from from the hospital to the home birth to all the variations in between, you know, and Something that I'm constantly trying to remind myself of is, or maybe ask the question of like, how did people do this before? Right. A thousand years ago, or even like pre-agricultural revolution, like Mm -hmm. 6,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, how did people operate? Right. 
I find, and it seems like when people communicate to me their experiences that align with how people did things then, they always seem generally more happy. Yes. Because like, you're because that's probably what it would have been like. Like you probably would have been in a village. You probably would have had like ancient, not ancient, excuse me, like the, the, the wisdom carried down through the maternal elders. Exactly. They probably that. had assistance under them that they taught everything that they know. And you would have had sort of a team to like be there for you to bring this new person into the community, you know, and exactly. it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been a rushed thing. It wouldn't have been a situation where they didn't care about you. It wouldn't have been a situation where you didn't know the person, you know, right. so you kind of, you, you looked at all your choices and you basically said, I want something that like that feels comfortable to me. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one thing that was really shocking to me, actually, when I made that decision. And it was especially shocking to me because most of the people that I faced opposition from when it came to that choice mm -hmm. were other women. Really? And, and I was blown away by that, by, by the amount of other women who were just like, oh, I would never do that. Oh, what? You're, you're doing, that's crazy. You know, why would you do that? oh, I would never give, give birth without being in the hospital with an epidural. And mm -hmm. I don't want to knock epidurals. I don't want to knock hospital births. Sure. Sure. Because, you know, we're all individuals. Everyone's pain thresholds are different. And the most important thing when it comes to birth is that a woman delivers in whatever way makes her feel most comfortable, most confident, and most in control. And if that means in the hospital for you, that's great. I hope you have a doctor that you're really comfortable with. If it means an epidural for you, also whatever's going to keep you most comfortable and feeling most confident in that moment, you do that. But yeah, we're not here to yuck anybody's yum on this show. We're just here to kind of talk about the way we like it, to do things and why, you know? It is disparaging to notice um, how little confidence there is in this act that our bodies are, they're, they're made for that. Mm -hmm. That's a process that your body knows by heart mm -hmm. without ever having done it before. You know, we, when it comes to growing an entire functioning human being in our bodies, there's nothing that we technically need to do. Yes, we take prenatal vitamins to help aid our body in that process. But if we didn't, if we just completely ignored it and said, la, 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 not happening, our body would still completely go through that entire process, create that entire fully functioning human being, and then bring it into this world because we just have that written and embedded in our DNA. Um, so it was just mind boggling to me. The number of women that I came across were like, that's crazy. Well, I thought it was an interesting part of your story when you said that that Jason was like, mm, I don't know about that. He's like, ah. but then ultimately that he came around. I think it's really funny because uh, he trusts you. You know, like at first he was hesitant because he's like, that's new and scary. And it's normal to be afraid of new, scary things, you know, um, but that you were able to kind of not, maybe not convince him, but bring him around to understanding why you wanted to do that and him being on board and being supportive. That's huge. So I know for him, he wanted to make sure that he met the midwife first. He was like, you know, I, I want to meet this woman and sure. listen to what she has to say. And, you know, I have my questions about the process and, you know, how it's going to happen and, you know, what happens in the event of an emergency where things aren't going the way they should go. And once he had all those questions answered, you know, it just made sense to him that that's how I do it. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, we had families who, although they were like, mm, are you sure about this? We both had families who also said, okay. Um, you know, this is Jamie's body, you know, we can't exactly tell her, you know, that she can't do this the way that she wants to do it. So, you know, good luck. We love you. Hope everything turns out. Okay. And then we of course had such a long day, the day that I went into labor that we had our entire families texting us like, um, Hey, is everything okay? <laughs> Where is this little person? And she was just taking her sweet time. Right. Um, but it is, you know, as you said, it's, it is very interesting how radical that seems. Um, and people call it like a new age wave where women decide to birth naturally. And it's not new age. It's, it's very old. You know, this, <laughs> it's very, very old. This is how yeah. women have done Forever. it since the beginning of time Yeah. Um, until, you know, it was turned into a more medical situation for women. Um, but if you go back in history and you look at, you know, the history of birth, you'll find, you know, in the beginning stages of it being an incredibly hospitalized thing, you'll find some really horrific practices. Um, have you heard of twilight birth? No. So twilight birth was a practice, I want to say in the late 1800s and early 1900s that began. I could be wrong on that. Mm -hmm. um, they would not sedate a woman at all, but just basically really drug her up and put her into this weird 
twilight space, which was horrific. She'd experienced sometimes, you know, the epitome of like night terrors or something during that state. Yeah. And it would be this really traumatic practice where they would completely dope this woman up and, you know, remove her baby from her body that way. Um, and, you know, certainly that's not to compare it to what birth in hospitals is like now, because, you know, there's very compassionate care in hospitals, but it is a very, it's treated as much more of a, of an unnatural process than what it really is. Um, mm-hmm. The thing that turned me away from hospital births, you know, along with what I already mentioned was just the, the thought of being rushed through a process that. Mm-hmm should never be rushed, you know. Um, and I wrote something down as you were saying that, like, the first lesson that this little person learns is patience, mm-hmm. you know? Like, she can't be in a rush either, you know? She's coming out when she's ready to come out, and, like, if it takes t- three hours longer, 30 hours longer, like, it's part, it's, learn that lesson first. Your Smart. body and your baby, your body and your baby are in charge in that scenario. And you are just kind of along for the ride. <laughs> you know, your, your body's going to do what it's going to do. And, you know, you can help it to a certain extent, you know, with, you know, your mindset. I know that was crucial to me, um, my mind going into it. And I fully believe that my mindset was one of the reasons why I had the experience that I did with both pregnancy and birth. Um, I'm just one of those naturally incredibly optimistic people. And that kept me in really good spirits and stopped me from feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, and that's one of the things that, that makes birth, um, most dangerous for a lot of women is that anxiety and, um, you know, that terror that they feel because your baby feels what you feel in those moments. So if you're going into labor and you're panicking and you're anxious, you know, your baby is also panicking and anxious and that makes your body shut down to a certain extent and push, you know, push against its natural reflexes. And that makes labor longer. It makes labor more painful. It makes, you know, creates all these problems that might not have otherwise been there, you know, if that woman had had, you know, the proper support that she needed and, you know, the proper preparation going into that moment for her, um, you know, a birth plan that was actually really followed and her actually being in control in that moment and being able to decide what was happening with her body and what wasn't. Um, And that issue comes up a lot in hospital births too, where women have a really hard time advocating for themselves, where a doctor says, okay, this is what we have to do. Um, And if a woman, especially birthing for the first time, doesn't have somebody there to advocate for. Yeah. uh, Or she's just ignorant of the details and like, doesn't even know she has choices. She may not realize that there are other options. She may not realize that there are other choices than what they're giving her. And that could lead to a birth outcome that she never in a million years would have expected. Mm -hmm. Um, So the conversation around birth really does need to change to make it safer. You know, those statistics that I shared with you in the beginning are staggering and really scary. Yeah. Um, So much of that can be tied into, you know, the fact that women are not listened to and they're not given proper support in those uh, scenarios. And there's unnecessary things pushed on them in that process Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. speed it along and get it going. And so I have a question about your experience with health insurance during this whole process. Um, Optimistically, They would have covered similar things that they would have in the hospital. Now, obviously, that's probably wrong. Um, But you tell me what it was like. Tell me what it was like. So, for some people, you can be reimbursed through your insurance for a home birth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, For others, you cannot. It kind of depends on your carrier. I know with my insurance, I was not reimbursed for my home birth costs. Um, So we paid out of pocket for our home birth. Um, But what was amazing about paying out of pocket for that was that we paid throughout my pregnancy. And by the time Willa was born, that balance was completely covered. Um, it, it cost us $5,000, you know, to birth. And that's somewhat similar to a hospital birth. I have many friends who had, you know, hospital birth bills that were, you know, $6,000 and plus for having a baby. Um, I paid that same, you know, to have my baby at home, except by the time my baby arrived, that was completely paid for. So we did not have to stress after she was here about receiving, you know, a $6,000 bill in the mail and then having to budget that into, you know, our salaries after that, along with my not for a few months afterward, we did not have to worry about that hospital bill. Mm. Uh, but to answer your question completely, there are some insurances that will reimburse, usually not the full cost, um, but up to a percentage of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, many people will pay out of pocket for that service. Mm-hmm. So again, it's a problem here with the current structure where again, like the statistic you gave before 237% higher for black 
black mothers, the mortality rate, you know? And it's like, if pe people could afford the care that you really want and you really deserve, you wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't have these issues. I know in, um, in looking at the possibility of my, of my doula schooling and, and where I would like to take that, um, one thing that I'm constantly hearing from those programs is we need black doulas, you know, we need black midwives, we need um, black birth workers so that these black mm -hmm. women have that representation in that community. Because mm -hmm. um, the midwifery community is still relatively small because they're not recognized as actual health professionals. You know, that's something that they're still really struggling for. In fact, mm -hmm. midwives are you know, getting in trouble with the law in some states in this country because it, what they're doing is seen as illegal and irresponsible, despite the fact that they've had, you know, hours upon hours upon hours of training. Many of them are nurse practitioners. Um, it's just not recognized as an actual, you know, line of healthcare, um, which is bananas. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of the biggest reasons bananas. I want to, you know, segue into dual work because that's, there's mm -hmm. a real need. For that. There's a real need for doulas and birth workers of color so that that community has a little more representation um, and we're able to tackle some of those problems and some of those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so talking about another policy piece related to your experience, um, and I don't, it depend, obviously depends on what kind of work that you and your partner Jason are doing, but like what kind of paternity, maternity leave did you both get through work or what was that experience like? So that experience, um, it, I, you know, I, I didn't have any maternity leave. I had to use my FMLA leave, which was 12 weeks unpaid leave. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I took. And that was probably the most stressful part about the entire process was knowing that I was not going to be working for, I think I only took 11 weeks out of my 12 weeks of FMLA, of FMLA leave before I went back to work. So Willow was only 10 and a half weeks old when I went back to work and she started going to daycare twice a week. Um, that was my next question about like your strategy there. Mm -hmm. go ahead. It's incredibly an ideal um, maternity leave. I feel should just be a given, but paternity leave also should be um, one of the things that's really overlooked when it comes to maternity and paternity leave is that that paternity leave is every bit as crucial. Um, one so that that father has that time to actually bond with their baby. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that had all that time to, you know, create that bond, you know, that, that baby grows inside of us, you know, there's already that, right. you know, that amazing link. Um, and the father needs that time with their child to be able to create that bond too. Mm -hmm. And then also on top of that, that new mother really needs support in those first few months. Um, there's a lot happening. That responsibility of that baby is a crushing responsibility. You know, if you're trying to breastfeed, that is one of the hardest things you will ever undertake in your entire life. And you need so much support to get through that. Mm -hmm. um, postpartum depression and postpartum rage are incredibly common for women, but that's something that's stigmatized and something that they're afraid to speak about. Mm -hmm. um, these women go through this really traumatic process of, you know, birthing this new human and then they're left at home <laughs> alone to, you know, try and tackle the enormity of that and get to yeah. know this little person and, you know, they have this partner who's, you know, now probably picking up extra shifts, just trying to cover the spread of their partner not being able to work anymore. Um, and it's a really stressful environment for what should be a really happy time where you just get to spend that time with that new person who's here mm -hmm. and get to know them and slowly transition into being, you know, a full family unit and having that new dynamic. Um, so neither of us had any type of paid leave. Um, or any type of leave at all related to maternal or paternal care. Um, I know that's something that I would love to see in the change when it comes to speaking on healthcare reform. Um, we have to catch up to other developed nations where that's a given. You know, there are countries where they give people anywhere from six months to a year after, you know, they have a child to be able to really implement mm -hmm. themselves to that routine and get to know their families and heal their bodies before they, you know, get back to trying to balance all of those things at once. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's a balance too, you know, and it's like, it, it, it links to the, um, the wage gap as well too. It's a problem with the wage gap. It's related to that, right? In some yes. Way? So, mm -hmm. um, so, when it comes to the wage gap and when it comes to work in general, 
um, pregnancy is pregnancy is an inconvenience for employers. Um, it's actually not uncommon for women to be demoted or fired because they're pregnant, um, because that's just not a convenience. You know, there's going to be days when they're sick and they're not going to be in. Once that baby's there, um, there's going to be, you know, they're not going to be quite as reliable because things happen and you have this new human to take care of and right. you're seen as a liability once you get to that point, which is crazy because, you know, as a whole society looks at women and says, you need to reproduce, you know, you need to be a mother, you know, that's what you're here for. Um, and then you take on that role and nobody wants to help you with that role. You take on that role and suddenly that role is an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. You were restored that role and then you stepped into it. And now that role is a massive inconvenience. Um, and it's a hindrance mm -hmm. and it, and it is, it's an enormous toll and, you know, going from maternity care into childcare and scheduling, I know you asked, you know, what it's been like yeah. balancing that. Um, Jason and I actually have a pretty, um, a pretty great system when it comes to our schedules with how we work in some ways where mm -hmm. I'm off three days, three days a week during the week. I'm off Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays every week. Jason's off Saturdays and Sundays. So Willa has one of us home with her five days a week, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Because there are many families where both parents are working and their child's in daycare, you know, full time. And mm -hmm. they only have the weekends where they get to be with their kid. And Willa has one of us home with her, you know, five out of seven days a week. It's mm -hmm. amazing to have that. But that also means that, you know, Jason and I don't share any common days off. So it's very rare for us to have mm -hmm. days where three of us get to be together as a family. Um, that doesn't happen very often. Um, but it's just the fact that, you know, childcare is also incredibly expensive and it works right now where we only have to pay for childcare two days a week. Um, you know, if we had her in childcare, you know, full time, five days a week, the amount, it would be a rent payment, you know, what we were spending yep. a month on yep. childcare. Yep. And I can't tell you the number of mothers I know who have said to me, I quit my job because it was just cheaper for me to stay home. It was cheaper for me to not work. Right. Right. It was work yeah. For even if it's not, even if it's close, like let's say, exactly. I don't know, a weekly, you're only netting, I don't know, let's say a hundred dollars difference between the, the amount of childcare that you have to pay out versus how much you make, like yeah. you might as well just not work and just spend yeah, the extra dollars and have the time there with your baby. You know what I mean? Exactly. And that's, that's, that's really sad because mm -hmm. that then starts to eat into, um, you, you know, the advancement of women in society because we worked really hard to be able to work and earn our own money and have that own income and have that independence. Um, and then we're told that we can't have it all. You mm -hmm. can't be a parent and have that independence. Yeah. We're going to, you know, we're going to shuffle you back down to just being a parent because right. you can't afford to do both. Um, uh, so it has, you know, that ripple effect. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of like the broader problem that we have right now with capitalism. And I'm not like anti-capitalism necessarily, right? But it puts right. like it puts a lot of emphasis on the individual, mm -hmm. which is fine because the individual is ultimately who controls their own destiny, right? So it's important, right? But it also leaves you on an island as an individual mm -hmm. because a lot of these things that we do as humans are communal. Like right. this, this child, uh, you know, birthing the child was a community. You know, you brought these people in and you made a community with them. You connected with them and they were part mm -hmm. of that process, you know? And, you know, let's say looking back a hundred thousand years or whatever, if you give birth to this child, like no one's like making you go right back to work. Like there's probably like the elders are going to make sure you're good and make sure the baby's good. And like when you're ready to go back to contributing in other ways, like they'll transition you into that. They're going to have space for the child to be with like other children and like right. with like an organized supervision that like, you know, you're not paying $50 a day for. It's just like mm -hmm. part of the community that everyone's taking care of each other. And they know that these, you know, like you're investing in your future. Like these kids are going to be eventually the ones doing the work and the hunting and the gathering and everything, you know? And like, we're so far away from that, you know, mm -hmm. with our current setup. It's no wonder it doesn't work. And it's, it gets especially, um, the topic of healthcare is, is especially maddening. Mm -hmm right now because we are in such an upheaval and we are in such a drastically terrible state when it comes to healthcare and what's being prioritized, what's not being prioritized. Uh, and it's just, I, I don't know how we got to the point where 
the thought of taking care of other people is the most repugnant thing that someone could suggest to you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just wild to me, you know, when, when we speak about, you know, care for all and things like that. And you hear people say, I'm not paying, you know, for somebody else's health care. Right. Um, and you just want to gently say, but, but they're paying for yours too. You know, everyone is paying for everyone. So everyone is taken care of. It's, mm-hmm. it's a complete, the idea unified, it's a completely unified thing um it's not just for those people that you're paying for you know it's right. also it's for you right um i think part of the part of the problem is maybe like the root of it or at least part of the root of it is we're tribal beings we're tribal creatures so back in this time period that i'm talking about it was probably like your tribe and you did everything for the tribe and if it was other then it was other and mm-hmm. you probably killed those people we didn't trust those people. We certainly right. didn't get resources to help those people, you know? So now right. we're in this like global community or even this national community. And we need to have that same, well, let me back up. That tribal mindset is still part of our evolution. But we need to like broaden the tribe to bring everybody in because. Right having everybody be other and in this constant state of war and like, no, these are my resources and I'm not going to share them or like, right. I I understand that mindset, but it's like, you you need these communities in order to function. You can't, one person can't do it all, you know? It's true. So it's, it's frustrating. And how to bridge that gap is something I'm, I'm thinking a lot about to, to use the model of the community and the tribe in a way that doesn't have like the negative aspects of like, constant warfare with the other, you know? Exactly. Mm. Um, and that it is, it's, it's so nuanced and there's so many levels, um, that need to be knocked down because, you know, that, that can be tracked down to just the things that, um, the things that control our society and prop it up, you know, money and Mm. boundaries that create the other, um, Mm. completely imaginary made up things, but they control everything. Borders are not real. Currency is something that somebody, you know, one day somebody was just like, you know what, this has value and you need it to get all of these things. Yeah. And now it's turned into this ridiculous, crazy thing that every single one of us is a slave to. You need it. You know, you can't live your life without that thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just, we've, we've taken that and just yeah. like crunched it down until we've become these beings that are just like, mm-hmm fine and i'm completely and totally different from these people out here so i'm gonna do for me i'm gonna do for mine and i don't give a damn about anybody else yeah. uh, and when it comes to community you know you hear people use phrases like i love my country um and i find that people often don't really know what they're saying when they say that because a country a country is a people yeah you should love it's, your country country men your country women it's Too not a money not a money system it's not that's not a country as a people so if you love your country it stands to reason that you want what's best for that country so you want what's best for the people mm. of the country you can't say i love my country and then in that exact same expression say but i don't think i should have to help take care of anybody else you don't really love your country in that aspect. Then what you love is the potential of what your country can do for you as an individual. Mm. And you can't talk about community and, you know, how you're a productive member of society while you're also pushing back against the idea of pitching in to help make that community Mm. safe space for everyone in it. Right. Right. And there's another kind of primal element at play here too, because although we're tribal, Like we want to be in a healthy functioning tribe, but I think men in particular want to be like the leaders of the tribe. So like, it's not enough to just be in the tribe. You want to kind of climb the ranks. So you're somebody. So we're kind of dealing with this, you know, what's best for the tribe is at play, but like also what's best for me, because Mm -hmm. I don't want to end up at the bottom of the pile either, especially as a man has consequences, you know, for that. Mm. That's. (laughs) Oh, the patriarchal norms and. Um, and how that all filters down. Um, I mean, I could, I could go off about feminism right now. Um, and I mean, true feminism where, you know, we talk about, um, the disparities for both men and women in society, because women 
you know, we have plenty of things to complain about and we have, you know, things that we still need to climb, but, um, but you men do too, you know, you have these cards stacked against you where you're not supposed to be emotional. Um, and, you know, without that brute strength, you know, you're not supposed to be, you know, viable for the top of the totem pole. Um, mm-hmm. That brute strength is like the most important thing. Um, you know, those, those ideas that float around, you know, if your man can't change a tire, then he's not a man. If your man doesn't have grease under his fingernails, then he's not a man. Yeah. Um, and all these expectations as to what that's supposed to mean. Um, and they're really unnatural. Like those those norms that we've put together for our society, they really inherently go against mm-hmm. the natural things that we feel. I mean, you knock yeah. down to the most basic of primal instincts, yeah. and we have evolved far beyond those. Mm-hmm. And, um, and even like chimpanzees are smart enough to know that brute strength isn't a long-term solution. Like if you want to climb the ranks rapidly, yeah, brute strength's the way to go. But if you want to climb the ranks in a, in a manner that's sustainable, you're better off being cooperative and mm-hmm. reciprocal and caring, you know, because yeah. if you're just a tyrant and you r- rose through brute strength, then it's only a matter of time before two, two tyrants come along and knock you off. It's going to knock you off and it's going to be a constant power struggle. And then no productivity is going to happen because right. there's just going to be that wrestle for that top spot for the person who's in control. Um, it's one of the reasons why, and we're bouncing all over the place here, but that's one of the reasons why I do like, um, I do like what Bernie Sanders has to say. Um, and I'm in the same place as you, where I don't want to, you know, hunker down in there and say, you know, like, this is absolutely the, you know, path to take, this is it. Um, but when I look at, you know, policies and the things that he's been arguing for decades and, you know, the things that he wants to implement, Mm -hmm. he really and truly believes in giving power to the people, which is what it needs to be. Instead of the people looking up, you know, and glorifying, you know, this handful of people who just have their hands and everything and control it, that power should belong to us. We should all be able to work together um, and and take that back and be the people who have that, you know, his ideas about um, taxing companies and, you know, forcing them to give away, you know, 2% of the company until, you know, uh, the employees own 20% of it. That way they have an actual stake. Like he has all of these plans and mm-hmm. all of these things in place where he wants to take that power that's being held by those few people and disperse it amongst the people. And um, I have a hard time imagining why anyone wouldn't want that. <laughs> I know uh, we all, you know, no matter what we do in this life, we all seem to be working really hard um, to have some semblance of control over the direction our lives are going in. And we are unfortunately in this place. Many of us have grown up in that place where there's so little that we have control over, you know, in our own tiny little boxes, we have that control over, you know, the job that we have and the place that we live to a certain extent. And, you know, the things that we choose to undertake for ourselves when it comes to our positions in society and how society treats us and the things that are available to us and not available to us, those things are so far out of our hands. So more than anything, I want anyone um, to step into the spotlight who is talking about taking that and giving it back to the people so that we have some semblance of control over the direction that things are going in. We don't have that right now and we need it. Yeah. Yeah. He, to me, he feels like he has like the humble nature and the humility Mm -hmm. that we need right now to like do the groundwork to Mm do all the basic shit at the bottom that needs to get taken care of. We need to make sure we're healthy and we need to make sure we have good communities. We need to make sure we're taking care of the environment. Like if we're doing all that, like then we can start stacking things on top of that. But he's, to me, it feels like he's trying to bring us back to basics. And exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's, we need that so desperately. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know, you know, watching the democratic race has been really dizzying. <laughs> um, the the democratic race is is something of a circus this year. You know, what did we start with? Twenty candidates who are originally vying for that position, and many have dropped out. And now we're at what twelve, and that's still just trying to keep up with yeah, you know, where everyone was at, where everyone is at, and what their platforms are, and. And, and what they could offer. On one hand, it's refreshing to have this many people to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, our two-party system is 
it's a travesty. <laughs> Only I thought everyone two- loved it. I thought everyone loves the two party system. <laughs> no, no, I don't know anybody who likes it. Zero people. <laughs> like it. Yeah. I'm not part of that. Everybody. Yeah. No, everybody. <laughs> everyone's like, this is shit's gotten old. And that's just. I mean, there are underdeveloped countries who have you know voting ballots with 15 people on it. You know, can't we just have that? And you know, a vote is a vote is a vote, and whoever wins, like that's it. You know, have true... you heard me talk about rank choice, rank choice voting on this podcast yet? I have not. I believe I saw a description of it, and I wondered if you were going to get around to explaining that to me. So I would like yeah. to hear about. It. So I don't know if specifically like where you're referencing with 15 candidates, but you could definitely run elections that way and just do rank mm-hmm. choice voting. So right. let's just say, for example, you have to hit a certain threshold of like supporters however you measure supporters right and then you're eligible for the election and then as you when you go to the ballot you would just rank them i like this person the best i like this person the second best so on and so forth right down to the bottom you know and uh then when they count the votes uh i might not explain this exactly correctly but i'll try like you take the top two or three vote getters and like kind of set them aside and then you you basically look at anybody who didn't vote for those people and you see like who ranked them the highest of those three and then you assign those votes so it kind of like it it gets rid of the wasted vote problem that people have like i hate the two-party system but i hate wasting my vote even more with that third party vote that you know is just going to be sweep right right off to the side um and so if my first choice was like the 10th most popular then we look at like my second choice and if that was whoever then we just kind of cycle down and assign right Mm -hmm. There's so much logic to that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I really, I, I, I actually really like the sound of that. There's a, a, a lot of logic to it. Um, and I wish it were that way. I know mm-hmm. I'm not incredibly, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on the electoral college, but sure. it just, it seems common sense to me that that's not a structure that we should be working with. It should not be possible for 200 some people to completely overrule millions upon millions upon millions mm. of opinions and votes that just, I just think that's garbage. <laughs> I, you know, a vote is a vote is a vote. And people who defend the electoral college will say, well, these states need representation. Do the groundwork and get around to as many areas as you possibly can. I mean, do what you can with what you've got. Don't make it a power struggle. Mm. Get that message out to as many people as you possibly can. And where those votes fall, those votes fall, but let that let it be the will of the people. We can't have a caucus of two hundred, you know, middle aged old white dudes with a few women sprinkled in there, just saying, you know what? I know you guys wanted this, but overruled. Yeah, that doesn't seem democratic to me at all. <laughs> no. no, I would say probably not. No, um, and we've uh, I've talked about the electoral college on here a number of times now. It's I agree, it needs to go. Um, I think there's 537, maybe 30, mm-hmm. 36, something like that. Total, total, because it's 435 plus 100 plus DC. I forget how many DC gets, but something stupid. But it's it's insane. It's yes, small states are for it, but why? Like, why are we giving all this power to small states? Like, is is land is the land the people? Like, mm-hmm. what does that have to do with anything? You know, the land is the vote. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, we need to get, we need to do something about that. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Let's see. Where do, what do we leave off here? I have some other things I want to get to here. We talked a lot about birth. Anything else on birth before we move off that? I'm sure it's um, endless. endless uh, it is. It's a very endless. It's a very endless subject. Um, I just. I just want to. I just want to hear um, more positive conversations about that. That's one thing that I've been advocating really hard against lately. Is um, you know, moms out there with positive birth stories. Like mm-hmm. I really. I, I want them to share them, um, and I want them to share them a lot. Um, and I don't want women who have had traumatic experiences to feel like their experiences don't matter or that they shouldn't be talking about them because um, that was their experience and it's valid. And if it's helpful for them to talk about them, then they should. But when it comes to women who are expecting, um, I really want the women who had positive experiences to not be afraid to say that and to step forward because there's a lot of, um, you get a lot of crap 
for sharing positive birth stories. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've had plenty of mothers roll their eyes at me when I shared my birth story. Um, I've had them scoff at me. It it makes some women angry to hear that you enjoyed pregnancy and birth. Um, and I realize it's because, you know, they probably had traumatic experiences and, um, it makes them upset to hear that someone else did not have that experience. And it, you know, makes their experience feel even more traumatic for them. Um, but it sucks like that. Um, that's a really crappy reception to receive when you're talking about something, um, that did go well for you. And I would hope that in that subject, you would really want every woman, you know, who's going through that to have a positive experience. Um, so you're going to get eye rolls. You're going to get people scoffing at you. You're going to get people, you know, waving you out of there saying, whatever, whatever, good job on that natural birth. Um, share those stories anyway. Um, because women really, we desperately need those. Um, we need them so badly. You know, we need women to realize that it's possible, um, to go through that, that enormous change and, um, and not have it take, you know, completely take from you. Um, and one last thing I'll say about birth is, um, we struggle with our, with our identity a lot afterward. Um, I know I've heard from so many moms that they kind of lose their identity afterward. You know, they become completely, completely a mom and they forget everything else about themselves. And then one day years down the road, they look around at their life and they realize that they don't even know what they like anymore. And they don't know who they are outside of being a parent. Um, and I really want parents to realize that it doesn't have to be that way either. It's okay Mm -hmm. to be a little bit selfish sometimes and say, you know what? I'm going to take a trip. You know, I went to Iceland with four of my girlfriends in October, left my baby at home with her dad (laughs) and just flew to another country to have, you know, an amazing adventure with four of my friends. And I had some pushback from some of the moms that I knew saying, you're just going to leave and, you know, go do this and just leave your child. And I said, I am because I, um, there are other things about me besides being a parent. I love to travel. You know, I love to read. Uh, I love to write. You know, I have all these things um, that are still very much a part of me and I have to hold on to those things. And we all do. So any parents who are listening right now, don't forget um, that you still get to be you, even though you're mom and dad. So nurture those pieces of yourself. Take those trips. Have that time. Yeah. Don't lose your community to save your responsibility to want to one person, even if that person is the most important person to you, you still got to have, you still got to be able to be you, you know, one day those kids are going to go and you have to still be someone when they go and you have to be someone for you. So keep those things alive. Keep them going. Mm. I, uh, you mentioned reading Mm -hmm. and I have a note on here to ask you about two things that kind of tie together with reading. So it's like one is like your experience as a foster kid and like how that's how that's impacted like you being a mom now with Uh also a question about your daughter's middle name. Oh, you picked up on that. Oh, I sure did. (laughs) Little Ravenclaw, little Rowena Ravenclaw, huh? I'm sure that's what it's inspired from, right? It has to be, right? That is exactly it. Yes. So are you and Jason like both Ravenclaws or like you just both like Harry Potter or like how did, how did you I am, come up with that? I am a Ravenclaw. Um, to me, you know, her first name has significance for me too. I named her after Willa Cather. Are you familiar? No. So she was a Pulitzer Prize winning female novelist in the frontier era. Um, and she was an absolute trailblazer. So her Pulitzer Prize winning uh, novel was called um, One of Our Own. Um, but one of her more uh, commonly known books is called My Antonia, which is a beautifully written book. Um, but back in the frontier era, she was an absolute trailblazer. Um, she was a magazine editor. She was an English teacher. She was a published novelist. She wasn't uh, literally a trailblazer. Not literally. Because back then, I thought you were saying that she was an actual trailblazer. And <laughs> I'm glad we cleared that up. Yes, let's clear that up. Yeah. But she definitely, she to a to a large extent, you know, she paved the way. Um, it was partially because her writing style was different from other women, um, where she didn't really write many sentimental things. As a matter of fact, some of her writing, if you were to read it, you might think that it was being written by a slightly misogynistic male. <laughs> but um, she had, you know, she had a little bit of contempt for other female writers then because she did find them to be too sentimental. But, but you know, she loved um, dark writings like Jane Eyre. 
um, but she was such a powerful woman. I said, I need to pass this name down, this really powerful name. Mm -hmm. um, and I want my daughter to have a literary name so badly. So I pulled Willa from there. And then Rowena, I pulled from Harry Potter because when I was a kid and I was at the peak of my reading where I was just devouring things, Harry Potter, like that was the series that I just read like over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I'm a reader through and through. And I was so hoping that I could pass some of that Ravenclaw onto her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I bestowed upon her that beautiful name. Um, Jason is definitely a Gryffindor, um, mm -hmm. but I'm okay. <laughs> That's amazing. I uh, listened to the audiobooks for the second time when I was hiking the Appalachian Trail. Uh -huh. And when it was like really my only source of entertainment, right. like we really dove into the details and like obsessed over like the meaning of things and the Hogwarts houses and like all that. So like total, totally converted into a full fledged Harry Potter nerd, I would say. Yeah, it A Harry Potter geek, okay? I'm not a nerd. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being a geek or a nerd lean into that jordan Ge geeks are way better than nerds though in my opinion you know <laughs> I agree. nerds are like me. Me, 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 me me where geeks are just get excited they're just like wow ah, so cool so many things you know true words have never been said that's how i define it anyway but uh I, I talked with with jerry on i think that was my second episode become the mm -hmm. dragon about the Hogwarts houses. I don't know if you caught that episode or not, but uh, I did. I did not catch that episode yet. But I learned something new recently that connected back to that is like on the Hogwarts crest. Uh -huh. it, says, it says something in Latin. Do you know what it says? No. I don't remember what it says in Latin, but it translates to "never tickle a sleeping dragon." You're kidding. <laughs> Which is awesome because like that that's basically what I talked about in the episode with Jerry is that the Hogwarts houses connect with the dragon because if you can, you know, being a, a Ravenclaw is, is fine. It's great, you know, but if uh -huh. you can, if, but if you can combine all the positive traits of like the four houses, yes. you're a dragon. Like you become unstoppable, you know, it's true. It's and I uh, it doesn't say that explicitly anywhere, but I definitely like extracted that like from just learning about the Hogwarts houses and learning about the personality types and like where certain ones have flaws that the other ones don't and like how to integrate them. And yeah, see, I'm being a geek. This is what I'm talking about. So cool. <laughs> Cause like, if you, you know what I'm saying? Like if you combine the Eagle with the badger, mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. lion, with the snake, you get a dragon. Truly do. You see that? Oh my God. And she gives us a hint right on the crest. I'm going to be super geeking into Harry Potter when we end this conversation now. <laughs> hey, go check out the episode what I did with Jerry, like the part. Uh, I can give you the timestamp or whatever where we talk about it. It's pretty cool. I don't want to bore oh people. Gosh, do it twice. That. Share that timestamp with me. I will. I will. I'll send you that part. Um, okay. Let's let's do a couple more questions here and wrap it up. Already. So um, talk, you asked about oh, foster care. Yes. How does that? Yeah, because Harry Potter was also, you know, a foster kid. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why as, I kind of identified as, with him. As was um, Tom Riddle. Mm -hmm. One of the things the that connect them. Powerful dueling wizards that have ever lived. Oh. Yes. Um, so foster care was um, foster care was a very dismal place to be. Um, that's an terrible, an incredibly, um, and terribly broken system in this country. Um, that needs much re reform. Um, but I was in the foster care system um, on and off until I was eight. So I very much had a really unstable childhood. Um, mm -hmm. I experienced, you know, every kind of abuse you could possibly imagine, um, you know, in those foster homes. And, you know, that deeply impacted me. And it was in that time when I realized that I wanted to be a parent. You know, I was young, but I knew that the way that I was living was not... Um, it wasn't right. And I wanted, I wanted to give a child um, things that I didn't have. So I think parenthood is an especially big thing for trauma survivors, you know, people who um, went through abuse because um, you, you, you carry that with you always, mm -hmm. you know, those go through um, and they're very difficult to heal from. And it takes a really long time, but parenthood is definitely one of the things that helped heal me the most from that. Um, it's wow. crazy. To, it's crazy to look at my daughter and she looks 
so much like I did at her age. Um, and that, that sucks me right in the gut sometimes to look at her and see my face because yeah. I was her age, you know, I, I was going through some really terrible things and here she is, you know, this little spitting image of me and she's completely untouched by any of those things. <laughs> it's, it's, um, wow. it's this catharsis in those moments, realizing that, that to a certain extent I've come full circle um, and I have this, um, you know, this affirmation that, you know, those things that I saw for myself, even back then as a kid, you know, have now come to fruition and, you know, I'm doing these things I wanted to do. Um, it also made becoming a parent a much bigger choice for me, um, you know, because of where I came from. Um, I tend to feel, and I know some people think this is a very insensitive thing to say to a certain extent, but I feel that um, to a certain extent, um, rearing children and having children, it's not taken as seriously um, as it should be. You know, it's, you know, you're creating an entire person who's going to exist on this earth, you know, for a hundred years. And there's a, there's a lot you can do wrong. Um, and I know for me, it was especially important that before I undertook that, before I became a parent myself, um, I was stable and I was ready. Um, and I had a partner who, you know, I saw nothing but amazing things in and who I knew I could really depend on to, you know, to provide the right type of environment. Mm -hmm. Um, it was so important to me that, um, that I check all the boxes and make sure that it was something that I was completely ready to undertake. Um, and you know, now that I'm in it, I'm incredibly glad that I did take that stance and that I did make sure that I was in a space where, you know, emotionally I was ready, um, fiscally, you know, I was ready as I was ever going to be, mm -hmm. uh, physically I was ready, you know, um, I, I had an amazing partner to do that with, um, you know, if, if by some crazy, you know, crazy twist of fate, things were to not work out between myself and Jason, I would still be so psyched that I had a baby with that man. <laughs> he is just the most amazing father. Um, and it just, it fills my heart completely being able to look at my child and see that she's got all of the things I didn't have. She's got you know, two parents who love her and a completely stable home and, you know, that roof over her head and that great food and, you know, just more love than she could ever know what to do with. Yeah. Um, so, it's you know, beautiful. it's like people, it's so many, so many times it's so sad to see when like someone gets caught in a cycle. Mm -hmm. And they perpetuate this like negative cycle, you know, and to like see that you've kind of taken the opportunity to like break that cycle. And it's, you know, it's beautiful. Pl I applaud you. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's, it's been a lot of work. Um, but I think that's one of the most, that's, that's one of the best gifts that we can give um, to our future generations, you know, to the pieces of ourselves that we're, you know, bringing onto this earth. That's mm -hmm. the most thing that you can give them is to break that cycle um you know i'm not naive enough to think you know i think everyone went through um at least something you know that that maybe impacted them negatively as a kid um and you have to try and undo those things as an adult when you're giving to a child of your own mm. uh, i know for me you know your statistics coming out of foster care especially as late as i did you know i was nine years old when i was adopted um, once you hit double digits in the foster care industry, you know, it's, um, your chances of being adopted, you know, start to significantly decline, you know, people don't want, um, the older, you know, more damaged children who have, you know, behavioral issues because they've mm -hmm. seen and are going to require so much work to, mm -hmm. um, lend into your, into your home. Um, yeah. but people don't realize that with the system, exactly what you said is happening. There's, you know, that cycle where, these kids grow up in this foster care system and then they age out of that foster care system and they go out into this world, never having known stability, never having experienced, you know, real safety or real love, probably not being um, taught how to really care for themselves. You know, they don't have proper sex education or people that they feel they can trust and they end up pregnant and they end up having children of their own. And this cycle just repeats and this problem just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and expands. Um, yeah. and then you, you know, you get into really, um, the really hard hitting topics, you know, you, when you start talking about, you know, abortion and abortion rates and, you know, being pro-choice or pro-life. And, um, for me, it's always been, you know, pro-choice because, um, 
I was one of those kids who ended up in that system with a parent who couldn't care for them. Um, Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I feel that if someone doesn't think that they're ready to be a parent, then they should have the option of choosing not to do that because the implications of having a child who's going to be unwanted, the implications of having a child that could potentially end up in the system, Mm -hmm. those implications so far reaching and they have such a ripple effect and they feed this crazy cycle Mm -hmm. um that's you know we have close to half a million children in this country who need homes you know they don't have families um and so much of that stems from just like that broken system and that you know broken upbringing of all these people so there's much to be reformed when it comes to foster care, when it comes to, again, how we take care of the people in our society um, and the types of responsibilities we've done on everyone's shoulders. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It is a lot. But we're here. We're Indeed. doing the work. We're trying. Make the best of it. And Sticking together. I see more and more every day who are, you know, people who are finally stepping up to the plate and speaking and they're getting louder and they're insisting more on heard when it comes to these subjects. And I really feel that we're, we're entering that crucial time where that revolution is going to be possible and where people are finally going to find those voices and find that inspiration in each other. And we're finally going to start really hearing about these things so we can start breaking down some of those barriers and, you know, correcting all of these things that we've been doing wrong for so long now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, comes down to the individual to like accepting responsibility that you're you might not be right Mm -hmm. that's true and if you let go of being right and accept new ideas and you might grow and that's scary for people that's scary for me and i'm i'm relatively like open to change and new things you know so people who are close to that it makes it even more difficult but it's even more important you know exactly um you know I, i like to i like to think that I always like to, you know, to tell people that um, perfection is, that's a stupid idea, first of all. So stupid. Um, First of all, you don't want to reach perfection because you're going to be really freaking bored when you get there. Like, what what do you do once you reach that place? What do you do? Um, Every person should be constantly evolving. Um, I would hope that nobody is the same person they were three years ago. And I would hope that three years from now, you won't be the person that you are now. Mm -hmm. I would hope you'd be collecting experiences and, you know, experiences from other people and, and allowing those experiences into your heart so that you can better shape your understanding of the world around you and how you can better add to it. Mm. Uh, So I like that you brought that up because we should all be uncomfortably in change constantly. There should always be something that's evolving in us. You know, we should always have that slight level of uncomfortability because we're shifting and we're, you know, allowing something new in that we maybe haven't before. Yeah. I think about uh, Hitler. Mm-hmm. I think, I don't know if it was, I don't think his book was called Mein Kampf, but like his plan was called The Final Solution. Yes. And it's like, that's, you got the wrong idea out of the gate, buddy. There's no final mm-hmm. solution. That's like, you know, part, the Bible, I guess, would argue that like all of that is like Luciferian to begin with. Like if you think that you can outsmart God and you can, you can provide a solution that will be final and you'll never need, to, you'll never have to do anything to adjust to that into infinity. You're dead wrong. You're so dead yeah. wrong. And if you base, if you base everything off, you're right about that. It's all going to crumble down on top of you. Yep. Failure out of the gate. You won't even get there. Uh... Which might be discouraging, but you have to look at it like optimistically. Instead, you want to think about things like slow growth. And like understand that whatever you do is going to have unintended consequences. It's like whatever right. you do, commit to it, but also be prepared to like observe now again because you're going to have to like look what changed. Okay, what's the new landscape? How do adjustment. we adjust this? You know, and that's like Absolutely. embedded in, in the yin yang symbol too. You know, order and chaos and staying on the path in between. I, th- I, th- I like. I also like to remind people in my work as a massage therapist where I also counsel with my slight spirituality. (laughs) I do like to tell people the one thing that is completely and totally inevitable is change. Mm -hmm. It's completely inevitable. Nothing will ever stay the same. Your good times, they're not always going to last. Your bad times, they're also not going to last. 
you're going to have this constant ebb and flow. And the only thing that is completely inevitable is that things will not always be the same. You have to be prepared to adapt and adjust and grow and mold yourself into something new Mm. or you're going to be crushed by it all. Nobody wants that. The only thing constant is change. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right, Jamie Fenton. I had a great time talking with you. Oh, Jordan, this is so wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. So nice to see your face. Pick your brain a little. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course. Talk to you soon.